of Education at HEC Paris. And I have the pleasure to welcome you today at HEC Paris for this uh, special conference on the, with Professor Freeman. Hello, Professor. Um, on the topic of um, the new story of business, capitalism in the 21st century. First of all, before starting, I would like to thank our partner, First Finance International, Eric uh, is here with us, uh, with whom we uh, have de successfully developed three executive online certificates, two in finance and one in strategy. And I know that we have here some participants of the certificate, former or current participants, and especially from strategy at HEC. I would like also to thank the team and the IT team and all the executive education team that made this uh, conference possible. And also, of course, Gérard de Mopou, who was the organizer of the conference. Thank you to all of them. So first of all, <coughs> I would like to briefly introduce Professor Freeman. So Professor Freeman, you are a distinguished, uh, world-renowned professor at the University of Darden in Virginia. And uh, you are the author of the global bestseller in strategy that became a landmark in 1984, uh, Strategic Management, a Stakeholder Approach. You, received, you have received many honorary degrees, many awards for, this, for your work on stakeholder theory and on business ethics. And you are uh, co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Business Ethics. So welcome. Ed, and we are very pleased to welcome you here at distance from Nashville. And we are also very honored to have you on board. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Before starting the conference, I would like also to introduce our two panelists. Uh, the first one, Professor Peter Dussauge, professor at HEC Paris in the Strategy and Business Policy Department. He's the academic director of the HEC EMBA program the academic director of the Executive Online Certificate Strategy at HEC. Uh, Peter, you are also the author of many books and articles published in academic and practitioner-oriented journals on business and corporate strategy, and more specifically on the topic of global strategic alliances. So welcome, and thank you, Peter, for being here. And uh, I know that uh, many participants from Strategy at HEC know you because you are teaching in the in the program. Our second panelist is Professor Bernard Ramanonsou, uh, also professor at HEC Paris in the Strategy and Business Policy Department. Bernard is a specialist on ethics and culture in the business place. He was head of HEC from 1995 to 2015. And uh, Bernard, you're also very active in the scientific and professional community, member of numerous boards, and the author of a large number of communications and publications. And you are also teaching in the Strategy at HEC program. So thank you also for being here. Without any further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Professor Freeman for his conference. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. It would be an even greater uh, debate. Uh, it goes without saying a sort of struggle about the ethics of capitalism. That, it's been going on a long time, but it, it has acquired some uh, new urgency post uh, uh, global financial Christ crisis. Um, in my analysis, is there's uh, sort of oh, I'm, what I'm going to call the old story of business that's deeply rooted in culture around the world. Uh, the old story of business, I'll be a little more precise about it in a minute, but it's one you all know. It's the idea that business is really just about money. Uh, it's about the physics of money. And uh, when push comes to shove, uh, money is what uh, really drives business and capitalism. Uh, you see that in two, you see this old story uh, in two very uh, dramatic ways. Uh, one is a study of employee engagement uh, that some folks have done. And the idea is that roughly 84% is the current number of people around the world, uh, of employees around the world, 
are either unengaged or actively unengaged in their business. Now, if you're unengaged, you just don't care. But if you're actively unengaged, uh, it seems to me you're, you, you're, you're trying to undermine the very place where you work. Uh, and I, I actually think that it's, uh, I, I, I can't be too strong about this. It's just immoral to have workplaces where people are unengaged or actively unengaged. Um, the second number is uh, equally urgent. It's that roughly 20% of people around the world trust uh, business people, business executives, uh, that they're doing the right thing. Now, l- l- let me just do the math here. I think that means 80% of people around the world have low trust in business and in executives. Uh, And that seems to me to be a real problem. These are just two of many indications that there's something wrong with the old story of business and that uh, we need to think about it uh, in a different way. Uh, Well, so what's wrong with the old story? Um, You know, there's several ways to put this, so I'm going to put it in what I've come to call the kind of rude American way, for which I apologize uh, to all of you, uh, and say there there are five big lies. I mean, it would be better, as a more careful philosopher, as I was trained to say there are some mistaken assumptions or alternative assumptions. Uh, But I think this has got to the point where I'm just going to say, look, there are five things here that a lot of people believe about business that uh, is not very useful anymore. The first thing is this idea that making money and profits is what really matters in business. This is a tricky, this is a tricky thing because look, money and profits are important to a bit business. But so too, making red blood cells is important to me as a human being. I, I have to make red blood cells in order to live. But I don't think anyone would argue, I certainly wouldn't, that making red blood cells is the purpose of life. Yes, making money and profits is necessary for business. The idea that profits are evil is is a foolish idea. But uh, without a lot more argument, it doesn't follow that making money or profits uh, is the purpose of business. It's just a logic mistake to go from this is necessary to this is the purpose. Furthermore, you know, uh, most entrepreneurs, in, in my experience, and, and I know a lot of them, don't start a business to make as much money as they can. What I try and tell students who want to start a business, I say, well, I want to get rich, I want to start a business. I try to tell them to get a job. They have uh, a much, a much uh, better chance of making money uh, working for somebody. Because as a friend of mine in uh, Copenhagen who uh, ran a, started a restaurant called Noma said, look, we didn't start Noma to make as much money as we could because we didn't make any for the first 19 years. Entrepreneurs start businesses because they're on fire about something. There's, there's something they want to do and, and transmit to the world. It may be small or it may be big, but they're not just motivated by money and profits. The second uh, big lie or mistaken assumption is this idea prevalent more in the Anglo-American world, but it's still there uh, in the rest of the world as well, that business is about serving uh, shareholders or owners or the people with the money. Now, my take on this is that even if all you care about is shareholder value, how are you going to do it? You're going to have great products and services that customers want and are willing to spend money on. You have, want to have employees who uh, are engaged in the bid and the bid business and come with ideas <clears throat> who are not just there for a paycheck. You want suppliers who want to make you better. You want communities who want you there. And if you do these things uh, and you get a little lucky, Uh, you might make money. In other words, business is about stakeholder relationships, not just shareholder relationships. And if you thought only focusing on shareholders uh, was a guarantee of success, 
Uh, I hope 2007, 2008 got your attention uh, that, in fact, that's not true. The third sort of mistaken assumption is that business is best understood as uh, some notion of free, unregulated markets. Uh, and in the economist sense, these are perfectly competitive mar markets where price conveys all the possible uh, information. But this has never been true. Uh, business exists in society. Uh, society isn't an add-on. Business exists uh, within other human societal institutions like government and education and health care and uh, families. Uh, and it's best to understand business in the full idea of its humanity rather than as just about economics and money and free markets. And so um, I want to suggest that this idea that we could look at business in isolation from the rest of society uh, is, uh, again, a kind of logic mistake that's here. The fourth mistaken assumption, and uh, there's been so, so much written about this, I'm embarrassed to continue to say it, is that people uh, really are uh, just economically self-interested, so that they, they will be short-term maximizers of their economic self-interest. Well, we know there are some people who are short-term maximizers of their economic self-interest. We generally call them sociopaths. Uh, they only look out for themselves, and they only look out for themselves in the short term. Uh, most people are very different. Anyone who's ever been in love, anyone who's ever had a child, but knows that human beings are pretty complicated. Uh, and we're not just economic uh, mag maximizers of our short-term self-interest. And the research on this is, is overwhelming. The last mistaken assumption is this idea that business ethics is a contradiction. When I tell people I teach business ethics, you know, they have to manage not to laugh. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it is in, uh, uh, in France, uh, but people will say, you know, it must be a short course, or I didn't know business had any, or uh, uh, they'll say, gee, business ethics, that's a theoretical subject, isn't it? And uh, I don't like any of that because the business people I know, uh, several thousand of them over, over the years, um, are pretty much standard, you know, human beings. For the most part, ethical. Of course, we make mistakes. Of course, the world is complicated. Uh, so this idea that business, business and ethics don't mix is a toxic idea from, of business. And I think it's brought us to the brink of um, a crisis where what we need is a revolution. A revolution here in, uh, in philosophical terms, that's a conceptual revolution. We need a new story about business that doesn't rely on these mistaken assumptions. Well, thankfully, there is one of these. Uh, it's going on. It's going on around the world. Uh, and I am incredibly optimistic uh, about, about, about this. This new story, I think, is going to be uh, what a CEO friend of mine calls a new normal, uh, about becoming a more conscious, a more responsible business where purpose and stakeholders and ethics and values and sustainability are at least as important as profits and further will be seen as intimately connected to profitability. If you look at the, 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 the things that are going on around the world, I've just listed some of them here. There's a renewed interest in CSR, uh, and especially as it, uh, CSR connects to business strategy. Not as some standalone uh, bolt-on to the business, but as it's uh, intimately connected with uh, what the purpose of the bu business is. People are worried about philanthropy and sustainability. There's an incredible movement around the world about social entrepreneurship. Okay, are, are we back now? Um, 
I'm, I'm assuming I'll just pick up where I left off. I was talking about all these movements. And uh, the only, uh, so you can see there are lots of them from conscious capitalism to uh, responsible capitalism to socially responsible investing. I've left some off here. I think I left off B Corps and there are others. So if you think about all of these movements and you don't do what most academics uh, do, which is try to figure out which one of these is correct, but you think about what, what are the four or five ideas that are behind all of these things. These four or five ideas, I hope, are ideas that will make capitalism better. The first one I'm going to call the purpose, values, and ethics principles. And that says, look, purpose and values and ethics are as important as money and profits. Profits follow from even purpose. And there are a number of companies from uh, Danone in France, to Unilever, to Whole Foods in the U.S., literally the, to the Tata Group in India, uh, who really understand this, that purpose is what makes a company go. Now, purpose in and of itself is not enough because we have seen in the world some spectacularly bad people who had a purpose. Uh, we have had a, a renaissance of white supremacists in the U.S. They have a purpose, uh, but they need ethics and values as well. On the other hand, my experience is most people do tell the truth and keep their promises and act responsibly most of the time. This is what we want to teach our children to do. We need to expect that behavior from each other, and we need to expect it from our businesses. As long as business ethics is uh, uh, a contradiction, uh, what that says is we don't expect that from business, and, and that's a problem. Look, there surely are some people, some people in business, uh, who are not good people. We see this in every uh, profession. It's true in universities. It, it's true in churches. It's certainly true in government these days. Uh, but we can't conclude from that uh, that the institution itself is uh, somehow full of corrupt people. For every Enron, uh, there are 10,000 business people out just, just trying to do the right thing and create value for others. Uh, and so, look, Adam Smith knew that markets didn't work if people didn't have what he would call a sense of justice. He's very clear about that in the theory of moral sentiments. So we need, in a way, this first principle says, let's go back to Adam Smith. Let's understand that purpose, values, and ethics are really the cornerstone of business. And here I'm going to use business because sometimes thinking about capitalism, uh, there's so much baggage with the word capitalism. Uh, I don't have any any uh, uh, problem with it, but uh, if you do, just think about what makes a good business. And these principles, I think, are principles for what makes a good business. The second principle um, is, again, this idea that Businesses have always created and sometimes destroyed value for shareholders as well as customers, employees, suppliers, and communities. What else can a business do? It's got to have products, it's got to have employees, it's got to have suppliers. It's set in a community. This is absolutely common sense. When I wrote that old <laughs> book in 1984 that honestly I get way too much, way too much credit for, uh, my uh, spouse uh, who was a Wharton M M M MBA, read it and said, well, you know, this is just common sense. You, you're you never going to make a living at this. And so, you know, in a way, she was she was she was right. It was well, not the make a living part, but she was right. It's absolutely common sense. And to be perfectly honest, I didn't even think that stakeholders was the most interesting idea uh, in in the book. And I never understood why. People took that as some uh, radical idea because it seemed to me every business has always done this and always will. Uh, 
If you're going to lead a business, a start a business, you got to get these interests going in the same direction. The idea is how do you harmonize the interests of customers, suppliers, employees, communities, people, the money? It's not a question of getting them together, making trade offs. It's a question over time of getting them going in the same direction. That's the beauty of uh, the way I, I learned business policy and strategy was how do you get these things going in the same direct direction? Because stakeholders have an interest that's joint. How I create value for customers affects how I create value for suppliers and employees, etc. In other words, stakeholder interests are interdependent. Yes, in the real world, sometimes you have to make trade-offs. But if you continually trade off the interest of one group with another, then in a free society, those groups are going to go to government to have their, their interests taken care of. So, the, so the, 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 the skill here is to figure out how to get these stakeholder interests going in the same direction. Um, that means, by the way, that when you find conflict, that's actually a good thing. Innovation comes from conflict. Um, I learned this from uh, a guy who was CEO of a big American chemical com company who they was trying to clean up the chemical company and uh, announces for zero pollution or some lofty environmental goal and and puts in place a, a you know a generational program to really clean up the com com company. Uh, and this particular one has done an awful lot in the, in the ensuing. Uh, 20 years, but they still have a ways to go. The CEO was going around to all of the uh, facilities and telling them that, you know, hey, we really mean it. We're going to do this. As he told the story, there was one facility where the engineers come up to him and say, we, we can't meet the interim goal. We can't meet the first Interim target. We'll never do this. This plant and equipment's too old. This uh, process is too dirty. We can't do it. And so the CEO said, "Well, you know, we're serious about this. If we can't, if we can't meet the targets, we'll have to close this facility. We want me to make a trade-off: environment, community on the one hand, employees on the other hand. Employees lose, environment, community wins. I'm going to make that trade-off. So the engineers go away." They come back, uh, as he told the story, about three weeks later, and they said, look, uh, pretty much a miracle has happened. Uh, we figured out how to, how to do it. And the CEO said, well, what's it going to cost? He's thinking $10, $20 million. It's a big plant. And they say, well, actually, we're embarrassed to say that if we do it this new way, we're going to save money. Now, now, what's going on here? What's going on here is if you accept a trade-off, and a trade-off is all you look for, that's all you're going to find. If trade-offs are unacceptable, you kick into gear the, the, the only thing we've actually really got as human beings, which is our creative imagination. What's up here? We can't always find an answer, but if we don't look, we won't find an answer. So thinking about the stakeholders as a unit of analysis means trying to harmonize their interests. And I like the phrase harmonize because it means that the notes are different, but they sound good together when they're in har harmony. And that's the idea here. Uh, it literally changes the idea of the unit of analysis in a business from an economic transaction to a more human relationship with stakeholders. So the third principle is a little bit of what I talked about earlier, this idea that business is embedded with other uh, societal institutions. Um, and, and what we need to see here is we need to see new roles for these institutions. We've, already, we've seen the emergence of new roles for NGOs. Uh, in which people have more trust in NGOs. NGOs have been uh, oftentimes the go-between between business uh, and the rest of civil society, and they, they play an incredibly important role. Similarly, we've seen, the or we need to see, the role of government in a different way. We often see government as 
simply uh, refereeing or redistributing. But there's a third, and those are important roles. There's a third role for government here, and it's it's a it's a role of facilitating value creation. Uh, when governments uh, work with uh, business accelerators, uh, when uh, we could understand how uh, to create more of a society for entrepreneurs, when governments can help with infrastructure, uh, et cetera, with free trade, which sounds outrageous these days, but shouldn't. Um, they can facilitate value creation and trade. And so thinking about business as embedded in society uh, is an incredibly important principle in this new story. The fourth uh, idea here is that people really are complicated. In fact, business works because we're complicated. We have many needs and desires, uh, but we can cooperate with each other. Um, we can invent solutions to our problems. We can invent vocabularies that solve our problems. I, I have an outdated iPhone in my hand. And the way I see this iPhone is that it represents a history of human beings inventing vocabularies to solve our problems. We had to figure out what was metal, what was glass. We had to figure out, invent vocabularies of physics and engineering for what's on the inside. What we are as human beings is incredibly creatively uh, imaginative creatures who can invent vocabularies that uh, solve uh, our problems. Uh, I think if we see ourselves like that, we can come to see business as about a world of abundance, not necessarily of scarcity. Yes, sometimes we act for selfish reasons, but sometimes we act for other regarding in interest. Incentives can be important, but so are values. We are fully, complexly human. Evolution has selected us for our ability to cooperate together. Um, and we need to come to see uh, this idea of what a human being is as central to business rather than the predominant, you know, we're competitive, greedy little bastards out trying to do each other in. I think that's long outlived its usefulness. And finally, there's an idea I want to call the integration thesis. The integration thesis is the idea that you can't do business without ethics. You shouldn't do ethics without business. And these you can't do either of them without this idea that human beings are complicated. Now, here I have to lay bare uh, my philosophical roots in American prag pragmatism. Uh, I don't think there's a clear uh, fact, value, description distinction or descriptive, prescriptive uh, distinction. And we can talk about that in the questions if anybody is interested in, 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 in those things. The idea that, you know, it's about describing the world and yeah, that's all science is, ignores the idea that what scientists do is they figure out how to do things. The scientists working on the benches around figure out, uh, you know, what turns the litmus paper red, or what does this, or what does what uh, does that. And in business schools, I think we have to, in a way, return to the idea of of know how here. Well, let me uh, just uh, finish up here with a couple of things. I think the results of these five ideas would be what and, and what's emerging in the world is a different, more responsible view of capitalism uh, and or business, uh, if you like. And if you put these side by side, it looks like this. It's, it, it's not that, uh, it's not profits that matter in business, it's purpose, values, and ethics, and, and money and profits fo follow. It's not just serving shareholders, it's serving stakeholders, of which shareholders are one. It's not just free and regulated markets, it's business embedded in society and in the physical world. People aren't homo economicus, they are complicated. And business ethics isn't an oxymoron. We need to integrate business and ethics and, and society. What's the evidence? Well, what a lot of people want here is they want proof 
of necessity. They want certainty. If I run my business according to these principles, will I be successful? Uh, and of course, that's not the right que question, because if I run my business according to the principles of trying to maximize shareholder value, will I? No, of course not. There are no guarantees. I have often said, if you want a guarantee, uh, buy a refrigerator. That, that, that's the place you get guarantees, uh, not here. I think a more interesting question is, if I run my business this way, which we know in our hearts is the right thing to do, uh, is it possible that I'll be successful? The proof of possibility is in. The, the answer is absolutely uh, yes. Uh, there's a study by uh, some friends of mine in a book called Firms of Endearment that looks at stakeholder-oriented companies and how they perform. Uh, the returns are fairly are fairly stunning. These are U.S. public uh, ones, and there are some for non-U.S. Uh, companies. These aren't the only studies uh, that exist. Uh, there are lots of uh, of others, but I want to I want to uh, I want to be careful here. It's not it's not a guarantee. World's complicated. We don't know everything. Uh, you know, uh, the world changes at times. So there aren't guarantees here. There have been lots of examples of co companies that have been run in this way that haven't done very well because they made mistakes or the world has changed. Just as there have been lots of examples of co companies run according to shareholder value that haven't done very well because the world has changed and because they made mistakes. So uh, my favorite jazz Musician here, Miles Davis. Uh, so what? Uh, if you don't get that, uh, download Miles Davis's So What, and you'll have five minutes of unmitigated joy, which will repay you for sitting through my uh, my talk here. Uh, so what here? The new story of business empowers people. It engages uh, employees. It inspires them. And that's what we need. We need businesses with people that are inspired. In terms of business strategy, it, it activates and energizes business strategy. It's not just a matter of finding uh, a place to play where no one's ever played. It's the idea that you're doing something that's important. It's the foundation, the wellspring, if you like, for value creation. And thinking about ethics and values actually leads to discipline and innovation and efficiency. It, in a way, sets the ground rules, etc., Overall, it makes our businesses institutions of hope and makes society a better one. I want to end with sort of two uh, things here. I get asked all the time to, you know, boil all this down into one or two rules. And the first rule I'm going to call the Warren Haynes rule. Warren Haynes is, uh, is a great blues guitarist. And uh, um, I, was, I was trying to learn how to play slide guitar. I don't know if there are any guitar players in the audience, but when you when you try to play slide guitar, it sounds like you're basically killing the cat cruelly, and that sounds awful. And uh, Warren Haynes is teaching, and I'm trying, and uh, all of a sudden he stops, and he says, you know, when you play the blues, it doesn't matter so much how many notes you play. You just have to mean the notes that you play. Today's world, what we need are businesses that mean the notes that they play. And these are businesses and people that are driven by purpose, by their sense of values and ethics, by their sense of humanity. And finally, uh, there's a rule I like to call the Ben, M and Molly rule. Those are the names of, of my children. In fact, I'm at my, my son Ben's house now in, in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, at the end of the day, can we go home to our children? Uh, let me tell you what I did today that I'm proud of, that I want you to learn from. Because if we aren't trying to make our institutions, our business institutions is where I have the most hope, we aren't trying to make our businesses places for our children to live in, I, I, I think we've got the bar too, too low. So I'm very optimistic that the emergence of this new story of business will help us become the generation that uh, makes business fit for our children. Uh, let me stop there and thank you very much and apologize again for the for the internet out, out, out of cheer. <laughs> Thanks.
Thank you very much, Ed. Um, can you hear me? No? Ed, can you hear me? The answer is no. Okay. Or the non-answer is no. Ed, can you hear me? <laughs> is there anything coming through? Can you hear us, Ed? <laughs> no. Oh, can you hear us now? Yes, now. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Ed. Um, it's a very inspiring talk. And as we were preparing, uh, the two of us here who are basically going to introduce the discussion in 30 seconds, uh, we decided that we would do good cop, bad cop. So, okay. Bernard was my old boss, uh, he was the dean of HEC for 20 years, so I couldn't possibly let him be the bad boss, the bad cop. <laughs> so I will be the, <laughs> yeah, the bad boss is too late. <laughs> but I will be the bad cop. So, I guess where, where I'm concerned is that if we believe in ethics, and especially with a CSR sort of point of view, we leave it up to each manager to decide what is ethical and what isn't, what are good values and bad values, and as we know, uh, some values may be universal, but many values are somewhat relative, are uh, seen through the judgment of different individuals, and to be much more pragmatic, why should I trust the CEO of an oil company to make the right decision in terms of what is acceptable pollution, what is unacceptable pollution, how much carbon dioxide can be released in the atmosphere or can't? Isn't that an important enough topic? And all these questions, aren't they important enough that society as a whole, whatever the limits of society are, and I guess today it's pretty much global, uh, shouldn't society sort of decide that and basically impose on businesses what sort of is acceptable behavior or what is desirable behavior in the same way as the tax administration doesn't ask us what we think is the right amount of taxes to pay. Uh, so. Uh, I will, I'd like to sort of ask you what your reaction to that is, how you would view these things. Um, is it a matter of ethics or is it a matter of law and order and uh, society decides what the laws we live by should be and uh, there's some f form of enforcement mechanism and we hope that 99.99% .99 of the managers will do what is perfectly legal but there will be some enforcement mechanism to discipline the 0.01% who don't. And, uh, well, I think that's a great question. I have uh, maybe a couple of responses. The first is ethics for me isn't just a matter of I decide. Ethics is always at an individual level and an interpersonal level. People say all the time, well, you know, um, I, I, I get to decide. I've got to live, look myself in, in the mirror. I have to live with myself. So it's my ethics. Well, it's true. You do have to live with yourself, but we have to live with you too. Ethics is a conversation. And it's a conversation that has to go on in society. Right now, in civil society, again, I don't know how it is in Paris, here a lot of that conversation at a national level, it's broken. It's just completely broken. Uh, and that is very wor worrisome. The idea that we can find the rules, agree on the rules, get them instituted into law, uh, I think with the kinds of technologies we have coming online now uh, is going to be too little too late. We have to have this conversation. And you're right, it has to be across broad sectors of society, and business has to be a part of that. Uh, I, I think you're right. 
I'm not going to let one person in one industry tell me what's right for society to do. Uh, I, I think that that doesn't work. On the other hand, I don't have the faith in the political processes that all of this is going to be uh, there in perfect law. Yeah, in, a, in part, we have to have these ongoing conversations, and we have to get better at having those, because I'm not sure we are really good at having those now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as Peter was saying, I'm supposed to be the, the, the good guy. Uh, I, I will do my best to do that. It's not my favorite role, but it's... Uh, um, no, frankly speaking, thank you very much for what you've been seeing. I think it's uh, there is a, more than a flavor of optimism uh, in, in this very, very fuzzy and very difficult world today. Anyway, there is something which I, I can I, I can reconcile uh, with your um, your optimism is the fact that uh, there are if you look at the the at the at the world dimension, it's clear there are most and most more and more uh, discrepancy between the rich people and the poor ones. In other words, I mean there are some poor, some poor people who cannot play, or who would like to play the game you're describing, but they cannot. They're not allowed to. How to, to reconcile your presentation, your position in that point? Well, well, look, that's a, that's a great question as well. We, a colleague of mine and I have uh, taught a course the past few years on inequality uh, and how that, how that works. And what I've taken out of reading a lot of studies and data is the most troubling part of that is the inequality of opportunity. It's in that, because that leads to a loss of hope. And where people don't have any hope, for themselves or their children, uh, that's that's not good. It's morally wrong. Uh, it's socially unstable, uh, it seems to me. I, I think that's one of the issues we really need to address. I think business needs to be a part of addressing that. So when I say I'm optimistic, I, I'm not saying these are easy issues to solve. I'm saying I think if we can reconceptualize how we think about business, we get these issues on the table, and I think we can find some solutions to them. Inequality won't be solved by a government policy. It won't be solved by one particular business. It'll be solved by lots of people working on lots of fronts, from education to healthcare to business, to government, across societies, uh, and across all the sectors, I think that's a, a, a major challenge that we have that we have in that, that we have in front of us. Uh, and if we believe some of the, the technological thinkers, it's a challenge that's going to get worse before it gets better. I mean, look, all we're going to have left to do. Is, uh, uh, is is what we can do with our creative imagination. The AIs are going to do everything else. And if we live in a world in which the the education system is 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 so bifurcated, uh, where it's it's we don't spend very much time and effort on the creative imagination, uh, I think that's a problem. On the other hand. You have the ability to put most of the world's knowledge on uh, a very small screen for about $100. Uh, and if we could figure out uh, the human piece of that, you can create billions of entrepreneurs. And, and we can solve this, 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 this problem. Muhammad Yunus is already trying to solve the problem of how to get people to be able to feed themselves. Now, that doesn't solve inequality, but it is a step in the right direction, I think. So I think your question is terrific. I, I don't have the answer uh, to these problems. I do think business can be a powerful part of it if we can get out of this idea of seeing business as just about the money, just about shareholder value, et cetera. Thank you.
Passa. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Ed. Maybe we should uh, give the floor to our audience. Okay, you are almost 100 in this uh, amphitheater, and I think we have uh, a few hundred people connected at distance. So maybe I will ask first do we have some questions from the people listening, not for the time being? Okay, so uh, would somebody of you would like to put a question to Ed Freeman, please? Adrian, if you can uh, pass the microphone. So please uh, speak into the microphone uh, it will allow Ed to uh, listen to you thank you thank you very much the one question which is coming to my mind I think you presented very well the the Western part and the American part how about the China how about Asia where is the part of the this economy with the biggest tradition which we can see how this influence you know how the impact will have on the world in, in your mind well, again, that's a great question. I'm not sure I have the answer to. Uh, Asia is a, a very multicultural place. I mean, uh, there's China, there's India, there can't be two more different societies uh, in a way. The good thing about those societies is uh, the incredible entrepreneurial spirit that's in China and uh, in India and in Vietnam and in Thailand. Uh, and in other play places, I, I think that's a very good. That's a very good thing. Um, you know um, how they come to grips with some of the problems uh, that they have. I think will be pretty interesting. When I've spent some time. In okay. Um, uh, can you can you hear me now? Yes, it's okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'm assuming I'm I'm, uh, I'm assuming I'm connected back. So when I've spent some time in both of those places, I, I find the reception to the ideas uh, that I have to be very warm. Now maybe the people are just being nice to me. I don't I don't really know, but uh, you know the idea that business is set in society. Uh, is uh, uh, a, a very friendly idea uh, in both India and in China. Uh, India is just uh, uh, has a, a required CSR uh, donation. I'm not sure how that's going. Uh, and of course, China has many state-owned inter inter enterprises. So again, I think that's a, that's a re that's a real challenge. But I don't really see business as any different. I think these ideas are as important in China, where again, the idea of seeing government as facilitating value creation may be there. The problem, of course, is as a friend of mine says, says the flaw in your idea is government, when government's involved, it always becomes crony capitalism. Uh, and I think that's a that's that's something that uh, bears a lot more thinking. How do you avoid crony capitalism? Uh, you know, because ultimately that that cuts against this idea of uh, business creating value for stakeholders, and there being some notion of fair opportunity to do that. Another question in our. Audience, yes, please. Adrien. Hello. Um, I'm just curious to know um, your experience on Wall Street today, because my impression from Wall Street is is always is still very much shareholder maximization, right? I'm not sure my impression, particularly. I'm not sure they are uh, the guys on Wall Street. Like when you watch CNBC, it's it's hardly about stakeholder, like the whole ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I want me to say some, something that outrageous. And, and I'm on CNBC, which doesn't happen very often anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I think you get, in part, uh, you do get a lot of that in the me media. But one of the, one of the most encouraging trends on Wall Street is there's something like a trillion dollars now under management around what's called ESG. Uh, and uh, impact investing. Every investment bank, uh, every bank I know is trying to figure out what to do with this because um, many of its investors are demanding are demanding this. And so it's, you know, uh, if you're on Wall Street, I guess you might not think a trillion dollars is very much, 
uh, to a to a to a poor farm boy, it seems like a lot of money to me, uh, and it's a good start, you know. Uh, and I think that's just one more uh, piece of evidence that even on Wall Street, things are starting to to change. But look, this change is going to be generational. Think of how long we've been trying to change the story that men and women are morally equal. We've been trying to change that story for a hundred years. And, you know, I would just ask the ladies in the room, how are we doing? You know, do we still have some ways to go? Well, maybe not in Paris, but I could tell you here, we certainly do. Uh, and so it takes a genera- it takes several generations to change these these underlying, you know, uh, stories that society's built on, and it will this. But business schools, in my view, can either lead the change to do this, or uh, I think they they run the danger of becoming kind of irrelevant. Uh, and I hope business schools can lead can lead the change towards thinking about business in this more human centered way. Um, one for me during your presentation, there is one major point, which is the the word purpose. But beyond this word purpose, you're assuming that a company must last a certain period of time, a certain amount of time. Which is for many other people, and we were talking of Wall Street, uh, for many shareholders, they don't mind about the duration of the company. I mean, a company for them is just there to fulfill some project, but at the end of the project, game is over and they put their money in another place. So the fact that you're talking about purpose is very important. And of course, we all dream to work in a company we will last for a long period of time and at least the minimum of my own duration. But in real life, I'm not sure that many people consider that a company can have a purpose and can have a duration of several years. Who cares about that? Except to the people inside the company, of course. Well, I, mean, I, I, I would say again, it's it's easy to it's it's easy to do future history backwards. Uh, most entrepreneurs, in my experience, have a do have a purpose. Now, sometimes they forget what that purpose is, and sometimes, as John Dewey told us, means and ends get reversed here. You know, uh, the 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 money, which is the means to the end can become the end in itself. Uh, and those things certainly happen. I don't see companies as projects that, uh, you know, have a, 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 a certain discount cash flow for a particular point in time. That's, look, that's one way to look at a company. That's one, that's one vocabulary to look at a company. But it's not the only one. Companies are, cons- are, 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 are filled with human beings who, who have families. Uh, who have uh, hopes and dreams themselves. Uh, and that language is as important as the language of finance. Shareholders may not care about that. Uh, and if they don't care about it enough, then what you'll see is the demise of public companies. Uh, we're already seeing that in, 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 in the U.S. as people try and escape this. Uh, I mean, the number of public companies is going down incredibly uh, fast. So, I, you know, I don't know the, the answer to that. Certainly, some companies should go out of existence. I agree with you about that. Uh, how that happens, uh, I think, is trickier. Most entrepreneurs want their companies to last. Uh, if I, I'm not totally convinced. My, my, pers- my personal experience, personal perception, is that the young entrepreneurs are not anymore having a project for 20 years. They want to make money quick to sell back their own companies they have just launched a few months ago. 
They are working for that. Which is not the case, and that was not the case for people of my... So that was not the case for people of my generation, you're right. But for the youngsters, I mean, I'm afraid that they have another uh, objective. Sorry for... Uh... <laughs> well, so, uh, some surely do have that. I mean, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, there aren't many generalizations about uh, everybody. Uh, that there's some some really do have that. Uh, my sense is they're not likely to build anything that lasts if all they look for is to uh, flip it. Um, that didn't work very well in the internet boom of the late ni 90s, uh, etc. Um, maybe I have a different set of 27 year olds who are MBAs, but that you know they want to build something that lasts. Surely there are people there who want to flip a com com company and try to get rich. Uh, you know, of course that that that's right. By the way, they often want to do that because that's what we teach them in business schools, uh, and and that's a problem. It seems, it seems to me. <laughs> thank you, Ed. We have another question in the classroom. Yeah, th th thank you very much. I want to try to continue on this uh, idea of change. So. I was taking some pictures of some of your slides and sharing them live with a WhatsApp group I have with some fellow graduates from HEC. The, the only comment I got back live was business is business. So assuming you are right, and especially taking into account what was just said about short-term companies, can we really wait for one, two, three generations up to 100 years to make this change happen? How do we speed up this change? Well, I, I, that's a really interesting question. A couple of years ago, uh, I was part of a group at the White House that was trying to ask that very question. How can we speed up these changes, uh, et cetera? Uh, we're still meeting, not at the White House, but uh, uh, we're, we're, we're still meeting to think about, 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 about that. Um, in a way, I'm, I'm not sure it can be sped up. I'm sure there's some policies that would speed it up. Um, my hope is that if there's enough activity going on in business that, I mean, when you have a company like Unilever trying to figure out how to be purpose dri driven, that matters a lot. And, you know, they're not, they don't do everything right. Uh, no one company does everything uh, right. Uh, but uh, if there's enough activity going on and we can, you know, we have a saying uh, amongst uh, people in the music business, it goes like, like like this. If you got a good melody and you play the record enough times, people stop, they start humming the tune. And I, I, I think we need to just play this record over and over and over again. Um, and hopefully we can get people to start humming the, the tune. As long as we don't lapse into arguments about What's the absolutely correct one way to run a business? And that's what, that's what frightens me about uh, some of my colleagues is they want to find the one and only one way to run a business. And I happen to think there are lots of ways to run a business. There are lots of ways to, there are lots of purposes. There are lots of uh, ways to be perfectly, uh, to be perfectly ethical. And we have to have conversations about that. Thank you, Ed. We have another question from the front row. Uh, exactly about conversation. Uh, I was in charge of training executives uh, who were uh, responsible of different mines within a big uh, group of the mining industry. Okay? And these guys had three objectives at the level of each mine. Financial objective, of course, first. Then they have uh, objectives of maintaining. Sorry, I just lost you. <coughs> okay. Hello. Did you did you hear me now? No. He's cut. No. Hello. Small technical point. Just time to reconnect. If we can make it. Ah, 
Let's try to reconnect. Yeah, yeah, I think we're okay, back. you're back. Okay, so let's, uh, George, you can put okay. your question again. Thank you. No, I, I lost you at the, uh, they each had an object objective, they had three obje objectives at three, each mine. Three, yes, the each, so each mine manager has three objectives, a financial one, uh, a social one, that is not to kill people and uh, not harming the, 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 their employees in any way. Uh, having them in good, uh, keeping them in good physical conditions, okay? And the third objective was an objective uh, I've, of... I've, I've lost you after the social one as well. Uh, well, the social one is the, the, with the employees, uh, yeah. an objective of not harming them, not killing them, yeah. etc. And the third one was not polluting with their right. minds, okay? And so uh, having good relationships with, uh, with the local people uh, uh, in a more in a physical way, okay? So, and what they said basically is, what, what are we doing effectively? Effectively, at the end of the story, we are trying to maximize the financial objective because we are recognized with this objective. And it's extremely difficult you, we, in some way, I would say in, in mathematics, we, uh, we try to minimize the harm in the two other objectives, okay? So there was a need of conversation. And my question is, is more concrete. Uh, uh, what would you do as a, how would you organize this necessary conversation at their level, obviously, at the between themselves and the top management, yeah. uh, uh, how do you deal with this to to try to make some progress in this direction? Because this yeah, was that, presented that's a, by them. That's a great qu a question. Uh, I, yeah, I would take that as in part uh, why triple bottom line often doesn't work very well. Uh, I was at a meeting uh, last week. And John Elkington, whose idea that was, was sort of renouncing it. But, you know, I think what you have to do is you have to figure out how to have conversations about harm, about good that you can do, about uh, how you make this sustainable, about how you make it profitable. And you have to have those conversations with stakeholders. You have to engage the stakeholders that are there, especially for mines, especially at the sort of local uh, community. Uh, I mean, there are lots of examples of people trying to do the right thing, but talking to the wrong people. Uh, and if you don't engage the right stakeholders and really engage them in conversation, this is a process that certainly in the mining in industry is not going to work very well. So I think that process of stakeholder engagement is uh, one of the things that's very hard to do well. Uh, it's not just a matter of inviting people to meetings. It's a matter of having continuous dialogue and input with a lot of diverse groups. And that's a, that's a much harder thing to do than it is to say. So, I mean, I think you're right about that. I, I hope that answers it, the part of your question. Maybe I didn't hear it all if it doesn't. Okay, another question. You are asking for a lady, so I have a question. Hi. Um, hi, Professor. Um, my name is Anna Maria. I come with a question from the perspective of a lady who, meaning me, who has ran a telecom company for the past 15 years in the global markets focused on Africa and the emerging markets of the world. And I have built this business from scratch. And basically, I have led the business um, with a thought of stakeholders, employees, CSR in mind at a very high cost because I've been competing in Africa with the Chinese, the, the likes of Huawei. And mm -hmm. so my question to you is, uh, I call this what you're describing, which is excellent. It's a feel good capitalism. It made me feel great to share everything with my employees and with our vendors. But the detriment of all this is that we lost a lot of tenders. 
I have, we have built a portfolio, just to give you some numbers, of over 200 million euros, and we lost most of, the, uh, most of those deals um, due to the Chinese competition mostly. So my question to you is, <laughs> I'm kind of nervous when I speak in public, uh, my question to you is, how do we stay competitive as Western companies when we deal with global markets, and we actually want to feel good when we wake up in the morning and share this with the people who are around us? That's my question. Well, first of all, thank, thank, thank you, and, and congratulations for for what you built. That's exactly the sort of thing I've been ta talking about. There's no secret here. There's no secret, especially when you're in the middle of a system that looks like uh, it's crony capitalism. Again, I don't know the specifics of yours, but given how you described it, uh, it might be be that we have to out imagine our competitors. We have to be better at creative imagination. My guess would be that's probably what you've done to build the company uh, that you have. The stuff makes us, uh, I mean, I hope my message does make you feel good, but it's not easy to do. It's very hard to do. It's much easier to make trade-offs, to only care about the money. Uh, you know, to see government as uh, uh, a friend only when it's helping you uh, to, 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 to try and uh, ignore roving gangs of stakeholders or uh, not do much for employees or do the bare minimum. Those things are easy. To, to build a business that's purpose-driven, because purpose, purpose doesn't live in the words. It lives in the systems, in the processes. Nothing is more irritating to me than see a company who says, gee, our people are really important, but they have really lousy human resource systems. You know, uh, if people are important, why do you have such a lousy human resource system? Well, how do you know it's lousy? Well, the people tell me that, and they should tell, they should tell you the same. So I think doing this is hard. Uh, it is the right thing to do. So we do feel good. We know in our hearts it's the right way to run a, biz, a biz, business. But it's hard. It's hard, especially in a, in, a, in a world in which not everybody plays by the same rules. A student of mine did a study <clears throat> in which he looked at – now, he, he does a very simplified study. So the academics in the room, hang on for a minute here because I'm going to tell you a very simple version of the study. He looked at what happens if you're ethical in an unethical in industry. And he defined it very simply. He defined uh, unethical as you have to pay. you got to pay off some, some somebody to play. And he defined ethical as you don't pay. So the standard idea here is that if you're ethical in an unethical in industry, you, you, you pay a price, right? It's going to cost you. He looked at two industries. And again, this is a limited study. He looked at telecom in Zimbabwe, I think it was, and construction in India. Both cases, there was no, uh, I mean, you had to pay. And he looked at companies that didn't pay for whatever reason, for religious reasons, for ethical reasons, whatever. And what he found was amazing. He found that companies that didn't that that were ethical had a competitive advantage. But it's a little tricky. They had a competitive advantage, not necessarily because they were ethical. They had a competitive advantage because they knew how to innovate. And, and innovation and the use of their creative imagination are I think the essential tools for business in the 21st century, in this global economy, if we can't use our creative imagination to out-innovate our competitors, then, you know, we might not be around for very long. But it's not easy, as you know. Okay, we have a question from our participant at distance, okay, and then okay. it will be to you, but not to remember, we have a few hundred people attending the conference. Okay, so Amandine? Yes, we have a question from Fabrice. Would not the main problem be that the main motivation of business leaders is not to create value for the stakeholders, but first for themselves? Is it not just a question of short-term vision? Yeah. 
Well, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, uh, look, there certainly are enough people who uh, just want to, you know, work for the short term. Um, that that's that's there's certainly plenty of people like like that. Um, but again, I don't know how much of that is. See, the old story is really interesting. If I tell you that business and ethics don't mix, and you hear that in the media, and I teach it to you in school, and I teach it to you in business school, and this is all you know, when you go out into the world, what are you going to find? You're going to look for and find that business and ethics don't mix. That's what you're going to look for. We've created agency problems in business because we teach agency theory. I, I want to create stakeholder problems by teaching stakeholder theory. I want people to go out and look for and see this multiplicity of stakeholder relationships that we're enmeshed in. I want them to see that values and ethics are actually important and expect that of people. So it's just all social science has this sort of self-reinforcing quality to it. It's what Friedrich Hayek called the pre pretense of knowledge. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I think in part, you know, I, I tried to raise my children not to be short-term self-interested maximizers and to say, well, I'm in business, so I have to be that way, is the old story doing the work here. So I think we got to get rid of the old. We got to get rid of the old story and get back to being human beings in business. Thank you, Ed. Another question coming just immediately. Hello, Professor. Uh, some indicators would suggest that we're heading toward a new crisis, uh, economic or some kind. Uh, what would be the the possibilities of it? Would we go into would that represent a formidable accelerator of this? Uh, the opportunity to, to restart clean slates, or should that revert to some basic human behavior, reclusive behavior of each individual? A more pessimistic. Well, I think that's a great question. I'm not sure about the indicators you have in mind. I think we could always find some indicators that say we're headed towards a crisis. Very few times in history do you say, well, things are settling down now, they're going to get better. Usually there's some crisis looming somewhere. I, if it's worse than the last Great Recession, I, I'm not sure it will be helpful. You know, uh, I, I think in a way, uh, I've said this before, we've kind of, we're past the tipping point. There's no going back. There's, there's no going back to wholesale not caring about the environment. There's no going back to uh, the sort of cowboy capitalism that was rampant. Yes, those things still exist in pieces, but most uh, CEOs of big companies and small companies are trying to do the right thing, uh, in my sense. And and the story gets in the way. So uh, you know, I don't I don't know what kind of crisis there could be to speed things up that wouldn't be devastating. Hello, Professor. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I just love the fact that you combine ethic and business because I think it's very important that we combine that at front, up front, at the concept of uh, the capitalism and business. Um, so I, I think it's it's very important that you bring that to the mind of everyone here. Um, Thank we you. were talking about accelerating change and I think, and I think before talking uh, about acceleration, what we learn at HAC is do we, ha do we have the right direction of, of change because accelerating will not work if, it's, we, are, if we are not on, on the right direction. So my question will be on the change that are brought up by women in China, India, and Africa, with small business and slow change. What do you think about those raising women in, in economy? Um, well, I didn't quite get all of that, but it, if I understood your question, it was uh, about going in the right direction for change uh, and how fast uh, that can be. I, I think the 
at least the changes I see going on that I tried to outline are, are, are roughly in the right direction. I think it's um, dangerous to try and specify that too much. Um, you know, I get asked a lot, do you want, by usually members of the me media, do you want ethics or do you want profits? And my take on that is kind of like the question, would you rather have a heart or a lung? You, you know, I'm pretty much in favor of both of those things. So, uh, and I think most business people are too. Uh, most business people that I know uh, want to think of themselves as good ethical people in their companies as for the most part, uh, trying to make the world better and do the right thing. I don't, I don't think that's a big stretch uh, to say. So let me be clear, I'm, I'm not naive. There certainly are some bad guys in the world. Thank you, Ed. We have another question at the bottom of the classroom. Thank you, Professor. So, yeah, a few years back, actually, I participated in the uh, European Parliament in a forum, which is called the World Forum for Ethics in Business. And <coughs> one, one aspect of uh, this forum was to tell that when you are connected with the, with the spirituality, basically they were telling that that when you are connected with a, a higher dimension a deeper dimension of the human beings then that brings also sustainability in the uh, in whatever you do actually in terms of ethics and purpose and everything that you mentioned before so the question is what what do you think about the the spirituality to to maintain and make sure that this world in all aspects is more ethical? Well, I think that works for lots of people and, and uh, I think that's great. I'm, I'm not, uh, certainly not opposed to that in any sense of imagination. Um, there's another side to spirituality uh, and especially certain forms of it which have caused a great deal of misery in the world for a very long time. Uh, and so, you know, I think it, it depends on, um, on kind of how that works. We're all free to have our private conception of ethics uh, in a free society. You can have yours uh, based on your God. I can have mine uh, based on Darwin if I want. But we got to find something to agree on in the public space where you don't try to convert me to yours and I don't try to convert you to mine. And so it's finding that civil space uh, where we can uh, find some agreement on how we're going to live together, uh, which is important. Spirituality is a part of that, uh, but so is trying to figure out how to have a conversation with people who believe different things. I mean, if everybody believed the same thing as I did, we'll be fine. <laughs> but of course, that's obviously wouldn't be very interesting, but it would be fine. But of course, we believe different things. And we have to figure out how, with this incredible diversity that we have, we can get along. Now, it turns out, for the most part, uh, we want pretty much the same things. If I ask you to write down your top three values, as I've asked people all over the world, they all write down pretty much the same thing. You know, they write down some sense of uh, honesty and integrity. They write down some sense of responsibility or some sense of caring. The values are pretty straightforward. The cultures are different. Uh, just like uh, the values among most of the major religions in the world are the same, though the, the, the cultural versions of them are different. And so that's why we need more conversation, I think. Uh, and um, that's what I'm, I'm proposing, is that we figure out how to talk to each other about ethics, uh, not how to call each other names and uh, have this lapse into the kind of ridiculous political back and forth that we find in lots of play, places around the world now. One more question. Hello. Um, sure. Uh, I listened that uh, 
I listened that uh, many people are trying to look for uh, ethic in business. Isn't it uh, more uh, um, uh, consistent uh, to look for or to apply game theory in business rather than ethic? Because if you, as you uh, clearly said, if you expect to find uh, a uh, the same definition shared by everyone and ethic, I think it is, uh, it is useless and it is more um, uh, so, uh, so uh, relevant to, to, to look, uh, to try to apply uh, some game theory uh, um, uh, yes, uh, aspect than uh, looking for ethic. So I lost some of that, but I, I'm going to take your question to be, can't we apply uh, game theory to business to see what insights that give? And the answer to that is uh, yes. I, I actually, when I was doing my PhD in philosophy, that's what I did was game the theory. Um, some of the people who write about the foundations of ethics use game, game theory, et cetera. And I think there are lots of insights to be gotten from that. Again, there are lots of vocabularies that are relevant for understanding business. Game theory can be one, one of them. Finance is another one. Uh, you know, I'm suggesting the creative arts and the creative imagination is another one. And what we need to do is train our business leaders to have a multiplicity of these vocabularies for understanding and getting insight into what a business is. Business is a deeply human activity. We need insights from uh, spiritual reasoning, from uh, economic reasoning, game theoretic reasoning, socio sociological reasoning, uh, reasoning in the creative arts. We need all of those things to bring to bear on some of the problems that we've talked about today, like inequality, like poverty, um, like having a more humane conversations uh, in, our, in our society. How do we build companies in the developing world uh, where, where sometimes in the developed world as well, the, the rules aren't the same for, for everybody. So I, I'm, again, I'm a pragmatist. I like to think there are lots of vocabularies that we can use. We take the insights uh, that, that are helpful and we leave the rest of them uh, and see what we can do. Thank you, Ed. We still have another question from our uh, participant at yes. distance. Yes, we have a question from Jack. How do you measure company global performance out of economics concerning ethic, environment, or social matter? Sorry, could you just say the first part of that again? Yes, sorry. How do you measure, measure <laughs> company yeah. global performance out of economics? So if the question's about measurement, can you measure this stuff? The answer is sure. Uh, I think we've got some measures that we're, uh, look, we, we have more agreement about profit and how to measure pro profit than we do to measure how well we're doing with our employees. But we can find measures of those, those things. A uh, company I know and work, worked with had a set of values. They wanted to measure how they were doing on the values. Well, it was a perceptual measure, but they asked their stakeholders. They set a baseline, and then they just measured how much they improved it or, or, or didn't. So the measurement question, I think, is imminently answerable. Uh, look, we put someone on the moon and brought them back. Bringing them back turns out to be the hardest part. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we can measure these things. Uh, I don't think profit measures total performance. Uh, I think there are some ways to measure total performance, uh, but we don't have uh, a lot of agreement on those because we haven't tried to uh, we haven't tried to do it for very 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 much. And sometimes the way that have been suggested through things like uh, KLD databases and those kinds of things aren't very ro robust. But I think there's scholars that are working on this pretty much all all over the world and and uh I'm, again i'm pretty optimistic about that thank you one last question because time is running and uh, we know ed that you you are teaching this afternoon for you okay so we take the last question before closing the session hello uh thank you for your presentation uh one last uh, question uh you mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation that 
more than 85% of employees are engaged. And when you say they are engaged, it's because they don't share the purpose uh, with the company or simply they are not aware of the purpose. I don't know if you heard about this uh, theory. It's called the golden circles, explaining the, uh, how the company explain its purpose. So it has the three layers, the why, how, and what. Uh, th through the, the why, the company explains its purpose and its vision. Then through the how, it explains uh, the technical innovation and how uh, it can implement this, uh, uh, how the company works. And finally, what is the product or the, uh, the product or the, uh, the service that the company offers. So uh, in, in this theory, I, I don't see uh, the uh, ethics uh, part. So what do you think it fits in the how or in the why part? No, it's uh, look. I, I I know Simon pretty well. Uh, I think it's it's in the why. Um, that that's that's in the stories that he tells. That's that's where he that's where he put puts it. Uh, and also in this uh, latest book that he's done called Leaders Eat Last, which there's also a TED talk for that. If you haven't seen it, it's really it's really terrific. Um, you know, things start with why. Why doesn't always go. Uh, to ethics, or it doesn't always give us the sort of ethical answer that we have. We can always question that. But I think Seneca is, is absolutely right. You get people unengaged because they don't understand why uh, they're doing what what they're doing. We've got this idea that, you know, I, I don't know many people who want to get up in the morning and go maximize shareholder va va value. They want to be, a, as human beings, we want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We want to be a part of something that matters. You know, this is what we want for our children. Shouldn't be any different in business than it is in the rest of the rest of our lives. If some of you are there and you don't know, or you haven't seen the Simon Sinek TED Talk on, I don't remember the the name of it, but it's about the golden circle. Uh, it's really terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed enjoyed this, especially the question. Thank you. Thank you for being part of this fantastic conversation. Uh, just to conclude, I think that I feel very proud of being part of HEC Paris, as it makes it possible to have this uh, really fantastic conversation about business and ethics and how it is contradictory or not. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, um, Ed, for your fantastic uh, teaching and um, vision about business and capitalism and now i would like to invite you to join us to the cocktail i'm sorry for those who are connected at distance and i would like to say thank you for being here and uh, goodbye thank you bye have a good nice evening Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed it.